Hello everybody, this is the first Hit Me With Your Questions video and I am super excited. I am really, really uh, looking forward to this. I've had a sneak peek at the questions that you've sent in for me and uh, some of them have kept me uh, thinking all weekend. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, just to explain how this is going to work, um, I have got your questions here on cards. I've shuffled them up so I don't know what order they're going to come out in. And what I'm going to do is take each question and go in, kind of do a, a deep dive on some of them. So some of the questions might seem very simple at first. But when we look into the deeper science of it, things might get a little uh, complicated for some people. I'm going to do some kind of symbol to show normal. Normal will just be nothing. And then I'm going to do this for medium level explanations and then this for high level explanations. So if you're interested in a topic and it starts going a bit above your head, just hold on there and we will bring it back to a nice, simple uh, discussion after we've gone deep for a little while. I'll put timestamps for all of the individual questions in the description. So if you're only interested in, you know, maybe two or three questions, just go down to the description and find out where they are. But, you know, why not check them all out? There's lots of really interesting stuff here that different people have asked about. And I guarantee you'll learn something today because I know I have. Also, I had to change cameras halfway through, but it's OK. I don't think anyone will notice. So let's get on with it. Dave, how can I easily make alcohol at home? And uh, in fact, Dave was so excited about this, he actually asked that question twice. I think you might have a problem, Dave. But let's get into this. So there's roughly two ways of making alcohol. There is the way that uh, humans have been making alcohol for centuries, which is to ferment sugar. And the yeast organisms can use the energy which is stored up inside the sugar. And in doing that, they give off carbon dioxide and they're left over with a molecule of ethanol that they don't want. So they excrete that. That's kind of their, their urine. In industry, however, it's quite wasteful. First of all, you need to have these big vats with uh, your yeast organisms in them and also you end up uh, wasting half of your sugar as carbon dioxide. So in industry what they do is use a gas called ethene which has got the two carbon atoms for alcohol right there and then you just stick some water on that using an acid catalyst and you can make your ethanol directly. That is the easiest way to make alcohol if you can get hold of your ethene gas. Ethene is quite explosive. I would not advise keeping uh, a canister of that around at home. So uh, given that the word is easily rather than quickly, I think the best way to do it is to get a brewer's kit and then use any form of white uh, carbohydrates white starches, so we're looking at the classics, your potatoes, your rice, maybe sugar, and uh, use your fermentation kit. That'll get you up to about 5% alcohol. And then after that, you need to distill it. Now, the distillation process is quite interesting because lots of people get this wrong. What? As I was saying, there's a really cool TV program over here where they take the celebrities off to an uninhabited island and they have to survive for just one night. But one of the things they have to do is get hold of some clean drinking water and they often try distillation 
and they always get it wrong. Because a crucial part of distillation is cooling down this hot mixture of gases coming off of your original mixture. So you have to make sure you cool it down with a constant supply of cold water if you're going to get a successful distillation. And then you're never going to get pure alcohol that way. You're just going to increase the concentration. But be warned, distilling alcohol is usually the point where governments get interested. Next question. Why did chemists believe Mendeleev? Okay, this is really interesting and has quite a few interesting things to go along with it. So first of all, who is Mendeleev and what is there to believe? So Dmitry Mendeleev was the genius chemist that came up with the arrangement for the periodic table back at the end of the 19th century. We've all seen a periodic table in a school laboratory somewhere. It's that big kind of square looking thing with the two kind of towers on the sides. And what it does is it makes a really sensible layout for the elements of the periodic table. We can know so much about an element just by what part of the periodic table it appears in. Mendeleev was the first person to do that, to come up with that idea of putting the elements in this kind of two-dimensional table. He was sure there must be some kind of underlying structure to it all. And he was working on this idea for a long time. And there's a cool little story about how he finally got there. Apparently, he was playing his favourite card game, a game of patience. And crucially, with patience, you arrange cards going top to bottom, but also going left to right. And he fell asleep at his desk. And while he was asleep, he had this dream of the elements laid out going top to bottom and left to right. And that is how he made one of the biggest discoveries ever in the history of chemistry. And the question says, why did chemists believe Mendeleev? So why was there a problem with anybody believing this was a way of arranging the elements? Well, the problem was that from the very beginnings of chemistry, right back in the mid 1600s with uh, people like Robert Boyle, all the way up through to uh, the middle of the 1800s, chemists started, first of all, they had the idea for elements, the idea that there were some kind of uh, substances that were not made of anything else. You could break water into hydrogen and oxygen, but oxygen and hydrogen themselves were not made of anything. So they started discovering more and more elements the more that they looked. Gold is an element, silver is an element, for example. But they all had very different properties. Some of them were metals. Some of them were solid, but not metal. Some of them were gases, others were liquids. And scientists at the time, many of them were sure that there must be some kind of way to arrange them. There must be some kind of pattern. There must be some kind of sense behind it all. Whereas many other chemists believed that no, there just was no pattern all the, MS, all the elements were different. Why should there be any kind of a pattern? And looking for one was just a waste of time. This was a huge argument and went on for decades until Mendeleev published his table. So what was the big deal? Well, the first thing is, when you are trying to solve a problem, whether it's putting together 
pieces of pottery and trying to work out what the original form was. Was it a flower vase or was it a bowl? Was it a cup? Or whether maybe you're working on a secret code and trying to decipher a message. If somebody works it out, you can see it, right? If somebody says, hang on, and they put a whole bunch of the pieces together and they've got some kind of beautiful looking flower pot or somebody's worked out most of the message, maybe 80% of it, and you can see it makes sense, it instantly clicks. You go, yes, that's it. And that's what happened with Mendeleev's periodic table. Most chemists, not all of them, could instantly see how the patterns fit together. But he wasn't there yet. We need something more than a very convincing pattern. And crucially, what Mendeleev did was leave holes in his table for elements that had not been uh, discovered yet. And he predicted what their properties would be. And most of those predictions were correct. And that was something that nobody else was able to do. And that's what all good science can do. All good science can make a prediction, which then turns out to be true later. So the short answer is that Mendeleev's table worked so beautifully to arrange the properties of the elements, it immediately made sense to most people who were looking for some way to arrange these elements. But in particular, he left spaces for elements that had not been discovered yet and was able to predict their final properties. Next question. Kerry, what is the airspeed of an unladen swallow? I know what you're doing here, Kerry. I know what you're doing. And if you're not even going to specify African or European swallow, then I'm not getting involved. Next question. Why is an octopus so squishy it can fit under a door? <laughs> this is actually one of my favourite questions. I've been thinking about this uh, all weekend. So, another way of asking this question is, why don't octopuses have bones? Because if we didn't have bones, then we could fit under a door too. And the quick answer is that octopuses never had bones and they're better off without them. So what's going on? Well, octopuses have never had bones because they evolved from mollusks, animals like snails and slugs that we know on land and sea snails and things in the ocean. Now, those early mollusks then developed into animals called nautiluses, which could swim through the water fairly poorly and they had tentacles. But those shells were quite uh, a hindrance to them. They couldn't swim so well with the shells, they're obviously quite heavy, and it ended up being better just to lose the shells completely. And then we had a divergence between the squids and the octopuses going in different directions. Now, squid do have a bone in their bodies, and that's because having a bone helps their, their structure, helps them to maintain their structure as they are swimming through the water. But octopuses, crucially, live on the sea floor, in and around rocks and coral. Now, what this means is, if they have no bones whatsoever, they can squeeze into tiny, tiny gaps in those rocks and coral. And that means two things. Number one, it means they can get prey that are nestled right in those tiny, small holes. Things like shrimps, things like small fish, things like eggs, for example. And the other thing it means is that they can hide from predators. They can get right into these tiniest of holes and the kinds of fish that would come and eat them can't get to them. So they're better off without bones. So there you go. 
The reason octopuses are so squishy is because they've never had bones and they're better off without them. Next question from M. Abizar. If there is 70 milligrams per litre dissolved oxygen in polluted waters, how do you calculate the amount of substances that are still allowed and the amount of polluted substances if the polluted waters are 10,000 litres in ppm? M. Abizar, I suspect you're asking me to do your homework for you. Well, I hope you're joking, but uh, this does raise some kind of interesting points and some serious points too. So let's have a look at this question anyway. Let's start with the question itself. Now, this is from environmental chemistry. It's not really my specialty, but there are a few things here that I can guess from the question. The amount of dissolved oxygen is somehow an indicator of pollution. Now, in the question, it doesn't say what kind of pollution, but in fact, uh, a low level of dissolved oxygen is very strongly related with things like phosphates and nitrates in the water. And that's because they work as fertilizers for algae in the water, which uses up and consumes the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen in the water. So a high level of nitrate and phosphate uh, pollution would lead to a very low level of oxygen. The other thing we've got is this idea of a concentration here, uh, listed as 70 milligrams per litre. And then we have the idea of how much. So concentration is milligrams per litre. And if we want to know how much pollution, then we are going to calculate back by multiplying our concentration by um, the volume that we have. If it's milligrams divided by the number of litres, then you just multiply by the number of litres that you have. There's one thing missing here, which is some kind of scale to evaluate how much uh, oxygen means how much pollutant. OK, I don't know what that is. One interesting thing here is you say 70 milligrams per litre of dissolved oxygen. That appears to be a very high number. And I wonder if you really mean 7.0 milligrams per litre. But in any case, M. Amazon, I'm not doing your homework for you. And as I said, I think you're joking. But there are a lot of people all over the Internet that do this. I see it all the time when I'm looking at science forums. I'm trying to find out some kind of uh, general science question. And they're full of people that have just posted their homework. And why do they do that? I know for a fact when I'm looking at these questions, I know that the answer is right there in their textbook or in their lecture notes. And I know as well there are worked examples in those textbooks. And all you need to do is swap the numbers in the textbook for the numbers you've got in your question. This is a chance to learn something and learn a new skill. And while you're young is absolutely the time to pick up that skill. If you learn it now, you will have it for the rest of your life. You might think you've forgotten it, but if you ever decide that you're going to try and learn it again, or if you ever decide that you are doing something that's maybe similar, you will have those skills built into your brain. And as you get older, you lose that ability. It's kind of a superpower that young people have. The other thing as well is often students think they don't need this information. Maybe they've got to do chemistry because perhaps they're doing a biology course and the biology course has required them to do uh, a certain amount of chemistry. Well, you will be surprised uh, how much of this information comes up later in your life. When I was at school, I had to do metal work. I had to learn about using vernier scales. And I also had to learn technical drawing, all about making 3D diagrams of things very accurately. When would I ever need to learn, need to do metalworking or technical drawing? Turns out, in my research, 
I've got to make my own equipment. Using those vernier scales now is hugely useful to me. Those technical drawing skills, yep, I have a 3D printer just over there on the desk and my technical drawing skills help me to use 3D modeling software. So you never know when these basic skills are going to come up. So my advice to you, Emma Bizarre and everybody else that posts their homework on the forums, have a look in the textbook. You will find all the answers are already there. Next question. Can we really call subatomic particles fundamental? So let's break this question down. At the end of the 19th century, scientists had become, most scientists had become convinced of the existence of atoms. There were these particles that made everything around us and atoms could not be divided into anything smaller. But their existence wasn't proven until 1908. If you want to see a bit more about that, check out my video on a uh, complete history of the Avogadro number. But it wasn't long after proof that atoms existed that scientists then discovered that they could be broken into smaller things, specifically electrons and the nucleus. And the nucleus itself was made of protons and neutrons. Now, these are our subatomic particles. So the question is, are electrons, protons and neutrons fundamental particles? Or is it possible that we could break them up into smaller particles? Well, the first answer is that protons and neutrons aren't fundamental particles. They are actually made up of smaller particles called quarks, which are held together in the nucleus by other particles called gluons. So, we've already gone from protons and neutrons down to quarks and gluons. Can we go any further? And it appears that no, we can't. From the first definitive proof of atoms in 1908, throughout the 20th century, physicists made pretty steady progress in discovering new particles and in predicting particles that must exist. The last particle that has turned up that scientists were missing was the Higgs boson, which turned up in the Large Hadron Collider uh, a few years ago. So the situation is right now is that all the experiments we've been doing for the last 100 years suggest that we are now at the bottom, that electrons, quarks, bosons, and a bunch of other particles are as fundamental as we get. There has, however, recently been some interesting developments that suggest there might be more particles. Now, that doesn't mean the ones that we've got can be broken up any further. It just means that there could be other particles too. So the short answer is not all subatomic uh, particles are fundamental. Protons and neutrals are made of smaller particles, but it does look like that all of the sub, all of the fundamental particles that we have now really are fundamental unless some complete new branch of science pops up from somewhere, which is always possible, but from everything that we know at the moment, it's not likely. Okay, next question. Denise asks, we always take it for granted that positive and negative charges attract and like charges repel. What is the reason behind this phenomenon? Well, Denise, here we are getting right down to theoretical physics. And unfortunately, Chemists are about as good at talking about theoretical physics as theoretical physicists are at talking about chemistry. But uh, here goes. The problem with something like electric charge is that it is a really 
base fundamental property of particles in our universe. And when we get down to that really base level, we kind of run out of ways to explain why something is happening. We get to the point where we have to say it just is like that. Now, if we want to get maybe a, a better, more detailed description of what's happening, then we can look at some of our theories and we can make theories. For example, if we want to look at how charges attract each other and repel each other, we can look at something called quantum field theory. And at that point, we are now going to imagine that there is a field going all the way through space. And here's the problem. Now we have to say, well, what is a field? OK, and we can define a field, an electric field in this case, as being uh, a three dimensional grid of numbers. And every point in space has got a number associated with it. And when the number is high, that's a strong field. And when the number is low, it's a weak field. And when the number is zero, that's a zero field. OK, but now we've moved the question along. Well, why is there a field? We can keep going with these kinds of questions. And the point is, where do you get off? At what point do you say, all right, I'm going to work with this level of understanding now? In the case of charges attracting each other and repelling each other, I really haven't seen anything that is more useful from, let's say, a chemistry point of view or a general science point of view than just saying, because they do. Why do opposite charges attract? Why do light charges repel? Because they do. It's a fundamental property of the universe. If you want to play around with that, well, yeah, sure, you can go to some more uh, detailed theories. But even those theories are just models. They are mathematical models that give us numbers and calculations that seem to work for how these things behave. But really, we are just kicking the can down the road. We've moved from saying, why do positive charges and negative charges attract each other? Well, like charges attract. Well, it's because the vector space and the electric field creating vectors in space. But then we've just got to ask, well, why do electric charges create vectors in space? We get very quickly to the point where, well, that's just how it is. So I'm afraid, Denise, I think our best answer is because they do. Next question. When is a bond not really a bond? kind of looks like a joke to me. Uh, I don't know. When is a bond not really a bond? Um, but let's, I don't know, let's uh, take it as a chemistry question. The simple answer and the first thing that comes to me is when it's ionic. But, uh, ionic. well, when it's an ironic, <laughs> just got it, when it's an ironic bond, but that's a fantastic coincidence because it genuinely, I genuinely don't consider ionic interactions to be bonds. I genuinely don't think that uh, there is such a thing as an ionic bond. So let's get into that. First of all, we have to uh, ask ourselves, what is a chemical bond? I mean, what is it really? And it's kind of simple, but I think a little bit more complicated too. To the model. <laughs> I'm still smiling about ironic bonds. <laughs> I'm going to remember that one. Okay, anyway, to the model. Imagine these are two atoms and they're floating around in space in a vacuum. 
the positively charged nucleus inside this atom is still going to be able to see the negatively charged electrons in, on the outside of this atom, even from the opposite sides of the observable universe. And they are going to start moving together. The nucleus inside this atom can see the other, the electron cloud from the other atom. And the positively charged nucleus inside this atom can see the electron cloud from this atom. And the same thing happens, they're going to be moving towards each other. But as they get closer, the negative electron clouds can start seeing each other too, and they start repelling. And then the positive nuclei can see each other as well, and they start repelling. So these atoms are going to stop at a certain distance away from each other. These are polystyrene models, so they're going to stop there. But actually, the atoms dip inside each other's electron clouds a little bit. Now, here's the important point. When we start here, we have a certain amount of potential energy. And in fact, in chemistry, there really are only two kinds of energy. There is potential energy and there is kinetic energy. And it's the different mixtures of those two that give us all the chemical energy and sound energy and all that kind of thing. But we can think of it as just kinetic energy, which is the energy of movement, and potential energy, which is the potential to have kinetic energy. So if we pull these atoms apart, there is the potential for them to move together again. And that's what they're going to do. So now they are turning their potential energy into kinetic energy and moving together. As they move together with that kinetic energy, it's going to be lost to the universe at some point. Mostly it's going to be lost as heat energy when they finally hit each other and collide. It's going to be radiated out to the universe as radiation, infrared radiation perhaps. So, once they've come together and settled down, they don't have as much energy as they did have at the opposite ends of the universe, or just the opposite ends of our little box. That means they have lost energy. Now they have lost that energy, it's not coming back. It's off, gone into the universe, it's gone. Okay, could it come back? Yeah, but statistically it's extraordinarily unlikely. So they've lost the energy, and now they are stuck together. And that's what makes the chemical bond. They have lost energy compared to where they were before. They cannot fly around by themselves anymore, because now they are stuck together. So this is our bond, these two atoms being stuck together because they've lost energy. But here's the point. As you will know from a uh, basic chemistry course, there are two ways of looking at chemical bonds. There is simple electrostatic attraction. Opposite charges attracting each other. Boom. But there are also covalent bonds. Atoms share their electrons. And those electrons, by sharing the electrons, <coughs> The electrons fill a space between the atoms and the two nuclei of the atoms are both attracted to those electrons in the space between them. Now, that comes from quantum mechanics. And in fact, all of chemistry is about a balance between these two principles. You have uh, coulombic interactions or ionic interactions or electrical charge interactions that just pull things together, doesn't really care too much how it does it. And then you have quantum mechanics, which are the rules of how electrons and nuclei can behave together, and where we are going to find those electrons. Covalent bonds are ruled by quantum mechanics. And with a covalent bond, you can count them. You can say, there is a covalent bond, for example, here, let's just get my fix. With a covalent bond, you can say, here is the covalent bond. And you can count them. There is one bond. 
there are two bonds, there are three, four, five bonds. If you want to go up to the highest level of uh, bonding theory, go up to molecular orbital theory, now we start talking about bond orders, but it's more or less the same thing. We can also say there is no covalent bond on this side, and there is no covalent bond over here. So this makes a lot of sense to say here is a covalent bond, and these atoms are going to be stuck together with their covalent bond. But with ionic bonds, things are very different. Now, as long as we only have two atoms, a covalent bond and an ionic interaction, I'm going to call them, look very similar. In either case, the two atoms stick together. But the problem comes when we start building up these ions into a crystal. So, for example, let's imagine this is uh, a small piece of crystal here. We might have our positively charged cations here and our negatively charged anions. And these sticks are kind of a bit wrong because they aren't sticking together because there's a single bond here. They're sticking together because they have opposite charges and their surfaces are actually touching a little bit maybe overlapping very slightly. And the difference between an ionic bond and a covalent bond is that this, let's take this positive atom down here, is attracted directly to these three atoms here, sure, but it's also attracted to this one up here. It can still see that negative charge. It can still see the negative charge from this one up here and it can see the negative charge from this atom all the way back here, and this one back here. There's no such thing as a single ionic bond here. Sure, these atoms are touching, but there is a, a spherical electromagnetic field coming out from these ions, and it's that electromagnetic field which is creating interactions with not just these ions here, but ions that on this scale would be several miles away further on in the crystal. So you can't identify individual ionic bonds in the same way that you can identify individual covalent bonds. So, if you ask me, when is a bond not really a bond? It's when it's ionic. Okay, well, that is the end of part one. We have got more questions coming up in part two, so watch out for that next week. So, what do you think? Did I make a mistake? Could you explain things better? Maybe you don't understand something, would like to know a little bit more. Well, just write something down in the comments and I'll get back to you. And while you're about it, don't forget to like and don't forget to subscribe and you'll know when the next video comes out.